And what we're going to do now, well, what, we've, what have we already done? We first uh, obtained a first order, first derivative, con necessary condition for a point to be a local maximum or minimum. Then we uh, obtained a sufficient condition which involved both first order property, that the first derivative had to be zero or the gradient had to be a zero vector, and a second order property that the, uh, the Hessian matrix of second partial derivatives, uh, if it's strictly positive, that is, if it's a positive definite quadratic form, then we have a, we have a local minimum. And if it's a negative definite quadratic form, we have a, a strict local maximum. And so what we're going to do now is we're going to obtain a further necessary condition. So in the first part, we obtained a first order necessary condition, a condition on the derivative it has to be zero. Now we're going to obtain a second order a second order uh, necessary condition. So, of course, a necessary condition means a condition that is implied by maximization. So, our theorem here is going to be if x bar is a local, let's say, maximum of f, then the Hessian matrix evaluated at x bar is negative. Now, you might think negative definite because it goes the other way. If the uh, Hessian matrix is negative definite together with the first order condition. That's enough to guarantee that x bar is a local maximum. You might think it goes the other way too. If we've got a local maximum, then this is going to be negative definite. Not true. Negative semi-definite. And so, before giving a proof, let's just point out an obvious counterexample to show that negative definite is not correct. Let's suppose we have uh, a constant function. Let's just say f goes from r into r, and f of x is equal to c for all x in r. Constant function. Uh, so, of course, it looks like this. And, of course, every point is a local and indeed a global maximizer of f and minimizer of f. It's a constant function. And so if that said negative definite, it would say that the second derivative of f would have to be negative. But the second derivative of this f is not negative. Second derivative, of course, first derivative is obviously uh, 0 for all x in r. And the second derivative of f, of f is also 0 for all f, x in r. So the second derivative is zero. So if that said negative definite, that would be wrong. This would violate that, despite the fact that all that every x is a maximizer. So this is a perfectly good, if simple, counterexample showing that uh, the theorem is not correct if we have negative definite in here. Negative semi-definite, that's going to work. So let's give a proof. This time we won't start off by giving a proof for L equals 1. We'll go straight to where we want to go. So let's uh, suppose that, uh, let's assume that x bar is a local maximum of f. And suppose that h at x bar is not negative semi-definite. And of course, 
not negative semi-definite means that there exists some delta x in, now we're in RL, such that delta x h x bar delta x is positive. Okay? But if that's the case, then it's going to be the case that for any lambda not zero, we have a delta y f of so delta x is now some given fixed delta x. And so what I'm now doing is I'm taking multiples, scalar multiples of that fixed delta x. And of course, what I'm going to do is make lambda small. But for now, any lambda that's not 0, we have this is f of x bar plus lambda delta x minus f of x bar, and of course, using our second degree, in second degree Taylor polynomial is the one we want to use because we're going to get a second order condition here. So we have that uh, this is equal to gradient of f at x bar delta x, so, sorry, that should be lambda delta x because it's lambda lambda delta x is the, uh, is the amount of displacement, is the argument here. So this would be lambda delta x plus one half. And now we have lambda delta x h x bar lambda delta x plus r2 of lambda delta x. Well, you're not going to be too surprised to see the next thing I'm going to do is to divide by lambda squared, because dividing by lambda squared is basically dividing by the square of the length of this vector, which will force this to converge to zero, which is, as, as in each of the proofs, that's pretty much what we need to do. So at least each of the second order proofs. Um, so this means then that 1 over lambda squared uh, f of lambda delta x. That's equal to, well, again, as always here, we, have, we haven't written that down here, but we know that if x bar is a local maximizer, our first order necessary condition is that the gradient be the zero vector. So this is zero. So this whole thing here is, let's just put a little arrow here and say, equals zero. And so now we have uh, plot, we have over here one half. Well, I'm dividing by lambda squared, so these lambdas come out. So now I have delta x, h, x bar, delta x, plus, and this, of course, is what makes things work, just as it has before, r2 lambda delta x. And, of course, what we have here is the second degree Taylor polynomial approximation. So we know that the remainder term in that approximation, when we divide it by the square of the length of the vector here, is, um, is, uh, goes to zero. And so here, well, you can see this isn't exactly the square of the length of the vector. But if I make lambda small enough, it will be it will be that. Or another way to do it is to think if there exists a delta x in RL for which this is true, then there exists a delta x with norm 1 for which this is true. Because remember that along any ray out of the origin, in fact, on any line through the origin, we did this back when we talked about quadratic forms, on any line through the origin, the sine of our quadratic form is the same everywhere except, of course, at the origin where it's zero. So uh, if this is positive, then I can scale the delta x down or up so that its norm is 1. And now if its norm is 1, then this is 
the lambda squared is the square of the of the norm, square of the length of lambda delta x. So this, well, in keeping with what we've done before, we will call this r, and I'm going to call r of lambda, because it's lambda that's actually varying. The delta x, that's a fixed vector that we, we obtained up here. We said there exists some particular delta x. Okay, so this is now r of lambda, and that goes to zero as lambda goes to zero. And so, and of course this is, delta x is a fixed vector, so this is just a number here that I will call, well, why not? We'll call it beta, as we have done in the previous proofs, and that beta is some fixed positive number. So now, we know that for small enough lambda, what we have is that this expression is positive because this gets smaller than beta. So this is positive, so f of lambda delta x is positive. So f of lambda delta x is positive, and that says that f at x bar plus lambda delta x is greater than f at x bar. And of course, if we're assuming that x bar is a local max, and so if this holds for all delta x's, or for all lambdas that are small, as lambda goes to zero, then there isn't going to be any neighborhood around x bar on which uh, all of the, the f, the values of f on all the points are no larger than x bar. It's always for every neighborhood of x bar, we're getting a point in the neighborhood for which the value of f is bigger than f of x bar. So this is a contradiction of the assumption that x bar is a local max of f. And so Therefore, it can't be the case that h of x bar is not negative semi-definite. So, let's just say, therefore, h of x bar is negative semi-definite. And we are done with that proof. So, now what we've done in uh, our three, three uh, parts of the lecture here, it kind of did get a little bit long, is we have established uh, when the function f is sufficiently differentiable, we have established a first order necessary condition that has to hold at a local maximum. It's a first order condition, so f only has to be differentiable one time, it has to have a derivative. We've obtained a second order, we've obtained sufficient conditions, and those conditions actually are both a first order together with the second order condition to ensure that x bar is a local maximum, the first order condition being that the derivative or the gradient uh, of f at x bar be zero, or the zero vector, and the second order condition being that the quadratic form has the right sign, that it's negative semi-definite for a local max, that it's positive semi-definite for a local min, and now finally a second order necessary condition to go along with our first order necessary condition. So now we know that, uh, an, that an implication, an implication that will follow from x bar being a maximum, it will follow because of necessary conditions, a First order condition that follows is the derivative of zero. Second order condition is a condition on the second, uh, second partial derivatives, uh, on the, the Hessian matrix of second partials of our function. So that really uh, is a pretty complete picture of uh, necessary and sufficient conditions for uh, local maximization local 
minimization. What we need to do going forward are two things. We need to see how this compares to being a global maximum. And for that, we're going to want to know about whether the function is concave or convex. And the second thing we're going to want to do is we want to be able to do all of these things for constrained optimization. When we're trying to maximize a function subject to one or more constraints. So that's where we will be going next. Uh, but this is it for today. Uh, see you all next time.